Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here and uh, to demonstrate my use of the robot. I wanted to start off uh, just showing a few of the things that I've, that I've done. Um, I think it's helpful to know open, uh, purely percutaneous, and then sort of a modified technique, and I would like the opportunity to show you those three techniques. First, I want to show you just how we program the robot. Um, you know, we have our screws are already mapped out here for most of the levels, but I left one off here at T8, and so we can just drag drag and drop that screw there, and then move it into the position that we want. We're going to try to maximize the minimal pedicle, and uh, we can use this to see are we contained as we go up and down the pedicle itself. And the goal here, of course, is to have it safely placed within the confines of the pedicle and to have optimal trajectory so that we have the, the highest pullout strength that we can achieve. Once we've planned it, we go through a registration process. Uh, for sake of the demonstration, we've did that uh, before we got on camera, but it involves an AP and a lateral pleuro shot, which is then uh, merged together um, in a way that you can verify yourself as the surgeon and then verify the level. And then ultimately, we go on to navigation. And so we'll start here with the left T10, and this will be an open technique. I have selected the screw. I then press on the foot pedal, and the robot will go to this trajectory. When it's in yellow, it means that we are on the right trajectory, but we're not at the set depth. And then once it turns green, I know it's okay for me to go. Now we have green. I have to bear in mind that the reference frame has to be able to see the camera in order to be registered, as well as the end effector arm itself. And so now we are in position and we can start the drill, of course, off of the patient. And Drill our screw. All right. I'm a tapper, so I'll take my tap and tap down the, the hole. And then we'll take our screw. In this case, it's going to be a 4.5 by 40 millimeter polyaxial screw. And when I've reached my depth, I get a check sign that lets me know that I have gotten there. Now, if you'll be so kind, I will do a uh, percutaneous screw. In this case, I'm going to switch down to our right L2, just so it's a little bit further away, so the tower doesn't interfere with our visualization of the other technique I'd like to show you. Andrew, while, while the arm is moving, I noticed that you're using um, uh, hand uh, hand drivers. Do you use do you put the screws in by hand or do you use power? I use uh, I use the hand driver. I've experimented with power, and it's yeah, I think it's very convenient and it can be very helpful for a lot of people. I actually like the tactile feel, so I uh, I, I feel a little more secure when I can feel uh, the tap going down and engaging the cortices, and then with the screw that I can test the bite. So for me personally, but uh, I've had partners that use the power and I, I think it's pretty neat. Um, and I can see maybe a little later in my career when the carpal tunnel sets in that that might be the right way to go. Now for a purely percutaneous, uh, I'm going to take the knife through the cannula and I'm going to make my incisions. This, these knives are offset so that you can turn it around and get a slightly bigger uh, opening. And cadaveric tissue, frequently we have to enlarge that ever so slightly just because the tissues aren't as pliable as when the patient was alive. So I'm just going to extend that a little bit just for the sake of the demonstration. All right. Now, using the same, um, the uh, same green as go, I'm going to take my burr and I'm going to burr out the starting spot here. And this will also help prevent some skive by having a flat area for the screw, the drill to engage. All right. Now I'll move on to my drill.
I have my tap. And then my screw. You may notice that I'm putting the putting these instruments down with the balls to facing the table because if I have the reference frame get in the way, then it loses sight of which instrument it's actually working on. This took our team a little while to figure that out. That that's how that goes. But ultimately we got it. All right. Now my preferred technique for placing these screws is actually a combination of these two. I generally am making an open midline incision so that I can do a laminectomy and use, I think I might be engaged on that joint here. There we go. Um, and so typically uh, when I'm doing this, I will um, have an assistant help retract the skin away, but then I'll go percutaneous through the fascia. And this works out well from a cosmetic standpoint, and it allows me to get some of these farther trajectories where the angles may need to be a little more lateral to medial uh, without having multiple stab wounds through the skin. Um, and since I'm gonna be doing a central decompression anyways, it allows me to have that. So typically we'll have a small, Maybe I'll do T11 here on the right, just since we're already open at that area. I'll have a small monectomy defect um, that allows me to have access to the midline, but I don't have enough that I could go all the way out and get a purely open technique. And so this allows me to do that. And my assistant will typically take the skin and hold that back. And then like so, and then we'll resend the robot in case that caused a shift in our trajectory, just uh, patient does move a little bit. And then we are able to do the same sort of technique where we go through the fascia with the knife, use our drill. Our tap, and then ultimately our screw and I'm able to capture that through my midline incision and place my, uh, my uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, the heads, the tulip heads, tulip heads on the, the screw itself. So in this case, I would normally be using a headless screw because I would then move the muscle over the side uh, and capture it from the midline. And, and Andrew, can you speak to the, all the things on the screen? I see something moving on the offset, something moving on surveillance and right. deflection. So if we have a shift, we'll get a, a, a deflection uh, notice here. And if it's a big shift, um, then it will tell us that we have skived, the skybometer, as it were. Thank you very much. Um, if we have a big shift of the patient, um, then we can ha have these reference markers down here that will be able to tell us that the patient has moved. Um, and these can be very helpful as far as uh, knowing where you are in space and assuring the fidelity between what we have here, the patient that we're trying to treat, and what we have here, the information that we put into the computer. So it's super helpful for that. Um, if you were to block off the DRB, the end effector here or the DRB, then you get a, a notification that those are off as well. Andrew, can you say one more time about when you attach the tulip heads and then pass the rod and you move the muscle at the end of the case? I think that's a pretty huge point there if you're doing per Sure. So what I like, when I do this modified technique, uh, typically we'll go perk through the fascia and I'll use a screw like this where we have, uh, I don't know if you can see that with the contrast, but the head, the tulip head is not attached. So then now once the screw is in the patient, um, coming through my laminectomy, my, my open laminectomy incision, I can move that muscle over, find the head, and place the, uh, the tulip head on at that point, and I can pass the rod through there. So 
You could imagine if you had a hybrid construct where you have, maybe you've done some work up front uh, down below and you're open up here for um, a laminectomy, you might have some screws that are inside the wound and some that are purely perk. You'd be able to pass your, wound, your rod from bottom to top through here and meet it up here with your screw heads. So you could, you could see a situation where you'd be able to actually utilize both techniques at once. Yeah, Andrew, that, that, that's a great point. And uh, I'll share, you know, I recently had a very large patient, BMI probably 40, 41, coming in with a T12L1 um, compression fracture in the setting of congenital stenosis mm. and, you know, now with bowel bladder issues. And so she needed an open decompression, but, um, you know, doing an open fusion would certainly have been a bit of a nightmare for that. So, you know, using the robot to place in perk screws and then doing an open decompression. And then, I mean, nothing will ever be as good as an open surgery for, for fusion, but I do think that there are a lot of adjuncts with, you know, facet fusions and, um, you know, and other uh, biologics now that can help along with that. And, you know, for her, especially mitigate issues afterwards like uh, wound infections and she was a rheumatologic patient. So, you know, just, just decompressing her neurologically was going to be the primary um, the primary issue. There's a few papers that have suggested that it's not necessarily the mobilization of the muscle, but rather the pressure on the muscle that causes a lot of the dysfunction of the muscles later. And so if you were to do this sort of technique, you could actually mobilize the muscles temporarily with a Army Navy or a Meyerding and get graft on the other side of that set on the TP and on the lateral aspect of the set joint itself. So you could do a pretty robust grafting there and with biologics, you know, uh, high rate fusion and just not have sustained pressure on those muscles. Um, and and there's, it's a continuum, right? The difference between a T-lift and a P-lift is a matter of a few degrees of angle, right? And I think the same things here, the goal being to minimize the disruption of the muscle. Percutaneous sure is nice, but then we worry about fusion. Open, great fusions, but then we worry about devitalization. Meaning somewhere in the middle, I think, is uh, where we're gonna head. And there's a lot of great technologies that enable that. I think certainly the incorporation of the robotics with the navigation allows me a great deal more confidence when I'm placing these screws in sort of these limited visualization manners. Um, and, and I think there's more to come. You know, one of the neat things about this conference is we're gonna see a lot of technologies that uh, will enable us to accomplish these goals with less and less damage to the adjacent tissues. Andrew, uh, love your technique. Um, I've done a few of those cases and I noticed some patients come back with some um, just superficial seromas. Have you had any of those? Uh, we, I have had some seromas and um, I think it's always a little bit of a, of a clinical question about what am I going to do with this? And um, I have moved away from do, using drains in anything but uh, my really, really big uh, cases. Um, and so there are times where we end up aspirating them and sending them off and seeing, is there anything going on? And they tend to be, uh, they tend to be sterile and short-lived, but um, it is, it's frustrating when you, when you see that. And I think that's related to the fact that we are disrupting tissues underneath the skin and underneath the muscle. And what we find is that there's some bleeding that occurs. The solid matter of the blood gets eaten up and absorbed, but the, the fluid can stick around. And uh, I think that's where that probably stems from. Not entirely sure how we prevent that other than just meticulous uh, hemostasis on the areas that we can see.